As we said in the second lecture, where we talked about various rumors about Nietzsche, Nietzsche's name is often associated with the word nihilism. Also, because Nietzsche is such a critical, apparently destructive writer, because he attacks so many things and so many people, religion, morality, Socrates, Christianity, it's often assumed that Nietzsche is basically a nihilist himself, or at any rate, a very destructive philosopher who has very little positive to say. We hope we've already cast some doubt on this view, both in the second lecture and in all the lectures since, but this time we'd like to focus on nihilism as such and its most prevalent uh, manifestation, its harshest manifestation, what is often called asceticism. Nihilism itself uh, is a concept that came into Europe fairly recently, just about Nietzsche's time, in fact, although there were certainly analogs back as far as ancient Greece. In fact, Socrates might be viewed as, in certain ways, attacking a certain kind of nihilistic thinking in the sophist. But in its modern incarnation, we trace the word nihilism back to the Russians uh, in, back in the Tsarist days. And in particular, I think the first popular use of the word was in Turgenev's novel Fathers and Sons. What that means is that the youths, the sons, rejected the authority and the values of their parents. For contemporary Americans, this is nothing new, but in old Europe, in Tsarist Russia, it probably must have been something of a shock. The concept of a nihilist, then, is something fairly localized, and it's just what we would call teenage rebellion. But by the time the term moved west and got to Germany, it had taken on a much broader meaning. A nihilist was someone who rejected not just his or her parents, but someone who rejected a tradition. And if you think about the sorts of traditions that were prevalent in Russia at the time, and certainly some of the traditions that would have been prevalent in Germany at the time, Again, this might have been quite a shock, especially, say, in a small German town such as the one Nietzsche was raised in. Rejecting a tradition can, of course, take on many different dimensions. It depends what kind of a tradition. Uh, it might be a fairly specific, narrow cultural convention, or it might be something much broader that has to do with a whole way of life. And consequently, the notion of nihilism spread to being the rejection of an entire culture and even the rejection of, a high, of an entire society. But of course, although Nietzsche fits many of these descriptions, in particular he rejected his Lutheran tradition as much as possible, and he rejected German culture as much as possible in Wagner, but also in the fact that he, from the time he started teaching in Switzerland at a very young age, spent virtually all of his adult and sane life outside of Germany quite conscientiously um, Nietzsche quite clearly rejected German society in many of its different manifestations. He even rejected the language, although he is probably its greatest writer. He said he really wished he could write in something else, like French, so that people wouldn't associate his ideas so much with Germany. But there's a certain limit. You can reject your society, but there's an idea of rejecting society altogether. That would certainly be a very extreme form of nihilism. And one can say of someone like Nietzsche that perhaps what, that's what he does too. For example, he spends much of his time in solitude, not just because he didn't have friends, but also by choice. And when Zarathustra comes down out of the mountains, it's quite an effort. And it's very clear that Zarathustra is very much in line with a whole history going back to the Old Testament of solitudinous hermits. And in that sense, one might say, it's not completely absurd to reject society, and insofar as one chooses to live in solitude, that's just what one does. But one is still not rejecting all values. And that's what nihilism in its philosophical sense really amounts to. In a note which is published at the beginning of Nietzsche's book, or the book that was published from Nietzsche's notes, called The Will to Power, Nietzsche writes, Everything lacks meaning. What does nihilism mean? that the highest values devalue themselves. The goal is lacking. The answer is lacking to our why. Now one can read that fairly straightforwardly as a statement concerning the meaning of life. And if you think about this in the context of Schopenhauer, 
there's a clear example of what nihilism would look like. We look to find the motive, the goal, the purpose behind all of our actions. We look to see what it's going to lead to, how it's going to turn out, how it will make our lives or other people's lives better. And the Schopenhauerian answer is, it's not going to make any difference. There is no answer to that kind of a question. And as for the why, a teleological why in which we ask, what is the purpose, what is the meaning? The Schopenhauerian answer is, there is no answer. There is no meaning. Nietzsche rejects this Schopenhauerian position, and with it, he rejects philosophical nihilism. It is a position he argues against and not for, despite the fact that there are particular senses in which one might say Nietzsche defends nihilism, or in which we might say that Nietzsche rejects the values or the traditions in which he took part. But if we're thinking about nihilism in this general way, then the question comes up, what would it be to reject values? What would it be to reject all values? Or what would it be, as Nietzsche writes in his note, that the highest values devalue themselves? What values is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about all values. Nietzsche says very clearly all the way through his career that if you want to define human nature, the first thing you must say is that human beings insist on value. We see the world through value-colored eyes. We do not know how to look at things neutrally, value-free. So it's not a question of giving up all values. It's simply a question of which values. And here, of course, his target comes into focus. What he's concerned with are two particular kinds of values which one kind of society, namely his society, has taken as being immensely important and absolutely central. First, moral values. And second, religious values, or more accurately, the values of the Judeo-Christian tradition. What's behind this, as always with Nietzsche, is an attack on values that he considers detrimental to life. And of course, one might find these elsewhere as well. We saw them in the overemphasis on historical scholarship, and we saw them elsewhere. But the truth is that religion and morality remain his focus. Looking back through history, one can see that the question of being positive as opposed to negative towards life has a very long history. In fact, it predates the Christian religion by quite a few years. In philosophy, we often distinguish between skepticism on the one hand and cynicism on the other. Thinking about these, we start to recognize that it's not just two slightly different philosophical viewpoints, although in fact they're often confused and conflated, but the truth is they're two completely different attitudes towards life. And Nietzsche would say the first, skepticism, is quite healthy. The second, cynicism, is most unhealthy. It's a rejection of life. Living with an attitude of trial and error, experimentalism, trying to look deeply behind things or under things, getting truer explanations, or rejecting explanations at face value. This is skepticism. It's a sign of mental health, something we encourage in our students. On the other hand, cynicism is sick. Cynicism is, in a way, being tired, being weary, being so skeptical that one no longer will accept anything. It's been said very recently, for example, that for someone in the current day and age to go around with a cheery attitude towards life is to invite the question, what's wrong with you? There's a sense in which cynicism is an, a view which is most unhealthy because it doesn't even allow for possibilities. Rather than looking around as skepticism does, it rather shuts things down. It's closed as opposed to open. Decadence from this point of view, is a form of cynicism. It can be very creative, and taking Socrates as an example, it can be brilliantly creative. In a way, you might say Socrates opened up whole new worlds, but that's just the problem. They were other worlds. They weren't paying attention to, and they weren't sufficiently appreciative of this one. So in short, one wants to say Nietzsche is against nihilism. It is what he spends his entire career attacking. And yet, one can say, in certain restricted domains, he remains a nihilist. For example, we emphasized in an earlier lecture how he's a nihilist about knowledge in one sense. He refuses to take the truth as something fixed, absolute, and easily accessible. 
Quite the contrary, he says, where truth is concerned. We should be skeptical. We should be very subtle. And we should not accept this notion of truth which says that the truth is something fixed and out there as opposed to something that, in part, we create through our experiments and through our living. He's a nihilist in certain ways about religion. Not all religions, and not everything about Christianity. But certainly, certainly certain central doctrines, certain central values, he does say, let's reject that. And when in Zarathustra, Zarathustra urges, come my brothers, what is falling down, let's push it the rest of the way. Basically, the image is not one of destruction, but rather it's preparing for the future. It's making room for something new and better. That's what nihilism is for Nietzsche. Indeed, for Nietzsche, many of the most important people in the tradition, both philosophical and religious, are people that he would like to move out of the way. We talked about a number of them in our previous lecture where we talked about favorites and targets. Among Nietzsche's most famous targets are several central figures, Socrates, Plato, and St. Paul being among them, that he does see as having played their part in history, but now need to be pushed out of the way. And much of his discussion has to do precisely with revaluing. One of the structural ways in which he talks about revaluation, and one that becomes, in a way, a kind of integral problem to, for his own philosophy, is the idea of revaluing or devaluing itself in the case of either Christian or philosophical ideology. In a way, he thinks the belief in the Christian God has devalued itself because part of the ideology that went with belief in the Christian God was a kind of notion of honesty and a kind of self-examination. His conviction was that eventually Christians, if they were honest about it, realized that belief in the Christian God was not very central to their conception of the, the, the real world, not very central to their conception of how things were, and that realistically it wasn't even true that the Christian God really played that important a role anymore. Once that became clear, it wasn't too much further to starting to recognize what Nietzsche calls the death of God, or at least the fact that belief in God is no longer so central to living in the Western world that this is the center of our culture in general. So he thinks that, in a way, historically, the philosophy and the religion that he inherited has already moved in such a direction that it's come to question its own beginnings. His tendency is, in general, to question the origins of things, not always with the aim of pushing them aside, but at least to ask whether or not values that we currently hold started out being the values that are important to us, and whether or not what initiated or what began as a kind of initially healthy move psychologically remained that, or whether it turned into something else. He writes a whole book called On the Genealogy of Morals. Bob will have a number of things to say about some of his analyses there, where he talks about the origins of some of our moral valuations and asks whether or not these were reasonable moves at one time but have um, ceased to serve an important purpose for us or a healthy purpose for us, uh, or whether or not there might still be reasons to retain them. I'm going to focus for a moment on the third essay of this three-essay work and talk about what, in a way, is one of the most problematic type of valuations for Nietzsche's own philosophy, namely the high value that humanity in general has frequently placed on asceticism, asceticism involving practices that seem to be life-denying. Why is this so central to Nietzsche? Well, on the one hand, he has this long-term background of thinking in terms of Schopenhauer's view of reality and his own agreements or disagreements with it. Schopenhauer's conviction was that asceticism was actually the way to make life good. If, after all, most of us end up coming to grief precisely because we take seriously our own obsessive personal desires, asceticism was a move in a very different direction. Indeed, if you engage in ascetic practices like fasting, you end up feeling, in a way, so removed from everyday reality, in a sense so physically weakened, that your concern about whatever particular fantasy you're entertaining in general at that point in your life starts to recede a bit. In fact, it's possible to start to feel relatively well willless, and that indeed was what Schopenhauer recommended, to renounce one's will and thereby to attain a kind of peace. 
Nietzsche rejects all that and favors instead a view that recognizes human desire for vitality, the human desire for power. And that creates a certain question for Nietzsche himself. If indeed humanity in general and all our basic actions are motivated by a desire for vitality and power, what on earth are we to make of ascetic practices? It would be one thing if ascetic practices were merely means to an end, a kind of instrumental way of assisting one's own health. For example, for some people, the need to cut down on cholesterol, at least in recent times, has struck them as an important means to the end of maintaining their vitality. Granted, their immediate desire might be for food that is rich in cholesterol, but there is a sense that if they change their diet, removing some of these foods from it, they'll end up feeling more full of life in the end, perhaps even in the short run. Now that would make sense on Nietzsche's analysis. But ascetic practices don't seem to really be means to a very obvious end at all. The idea is to fast for the sake of fasting, or to sacrifice things for the sake of sacrifice, to give up candy for Lent, not because candy is bad, but simply because it's a good idea to be able to give these things up. Nietzsche asks then, well, what sense are we to make of ascetic desires, um, the, the strategy of employing these ascetic practices? Is there some deeper motive that actually is a matter of will to power, or is this really something that falsifies Nietzsche's entire theory? Nietzsche concludes that there actually is a way in which ascetic practices do manifest will to power. But this manner is quite subtle. The basic idea is to split one's own sense of self into two parts, the controlling part and the part that wants something. If you give up candy for Lent, you have the controlling part that is attaining a kind of mastery over another part of yourself, the part that wants the candy. If you fast generally, there's a sense in which, although you want to eat, there's a part of you that is more powerful still. In a sense, Kant paves the way for this kind of split of the psyche when he talks about inclinations versus our rational conception of what we're obligated to do. Of course, Kant realizes there are all sorts of things that we want, and even that's part of our nature. Biologically, we do have desires and inclinations. That much is something that we can't do anything about. But nevertheless, Kant views it as not only a kind of important and noble thing about the human being, but indeed our moral obligation to resist those inclinations, not to, use, not to appeal to them at all in deciding what we ought to do, but instead listening to reason alone and allowing reason to tell us when to disregard our inclinations entirely. What Kant does there is to show us a kind of domination structure inside the psyche. We have on the one hand the controlling part and on the other hand the natural human being. And the, those sorts of philosophical systems that are used to justify ascetic practices generally do allow for a kind of willful assertion of something like the self or the self under one conception over another part of the self. And that's where Nietzsche sees the will to power having been sublimated. Granted, when someone is uh, ascetic, when someone succeeds in these practices, you would have to say that they have, in a sense, controlled themselves, not simply uh, given in to will to power on one level. But what they've really done is substitute one type of expression of will to power for a much more subtle one, but one that, in a way, gives them a sense of status, status and self-consciousness that might be enviable to the person that is more direct. There's a kind of sense of control of oneself that is, in a way, virtually complete. Along with this, Nietzsche sees a kind of self-righteousness that comes about. Someone who is able to control their impulses is able to not only feel on top of themselves or in control of themselves, but superior to other people as well. Someone who doesn't seem to have a problem with temptation in some particular direction can easily view those who succumb as inferior in lots of ways. And one need not broadcast this. There's a kind of internal sense of self-righteousness that really is its own reward. So Nietzsche would say that these sorts of practices are a good example of what he frequently finds in the case of human psychology, that what seems to be the motive 
the apparent motive is actually a disguise for something that is very close to its opposite. Now Nietzsche doesn't stop here. He goes on to point out that while religious traditions on the whole have tended to opt for asceticism of a pretty straightforward sort, often he would say a rather barbaric sort that weakens the practitioners, we actually have many more manifestations of asceticism than is commonly realized. Particularly in science, the broad sphere of human quest for knowledge, which he would say actually has this form from the time of Socrates, there's a strong sense of subordinating oneself on the one hand in order to gain something that expands your sense of self vastly, knowledge. In a way, the whole project of science is a lot like the kind of project described in Goethe's Faust, where the, key, the chief character makes a deal with the devil to sell his soul to the devil if the devil will give him these great powers to gain knowledge. That might seem like a, a bizarre sort of proposition to make, but I think Nietzsche sees that as a very real kind of parable to reflect the way in which science has been pursued. He certainly complains that lots of people expend all of their energies, their vitality, um, any kind of psychological balance in their life, all for the sake of pursuing a kind of dream that he thinks is very unlikely to reach much fruition in an individual life. Nevertheless, this remains a quest that he describes as will to power. This desire for truth is in a sense a kind of desire to ally your finite powers with something closer to the infinite. No longer simply an individual, one is a representative of humanity trying to acquire knowledge for the whole. This is certainly a step in the right direction if one views oneself as will to power. The same kind of move is made when the scientific worldview replaces the more religious worldview in the recent history of the West. Nietzsche calls a scientific worldview a kind of shadow of God that still lingers with us because although in a way the view of the Christian God is one of those cases where he thinks the highest values have devalued themselves, many of the particular images related to belief in God linger in the scientific worldview. People frequently talk about the designs of nature instead of the designs of God or view internal development of organisms as a kind of on a teleological model as fulfilling some kind of purpose. Nietzsche thinks it's very important not to simply transpose the habits that we've had in our religious past and move those to a kind of scientific worldview. And in part, he too is motivated by will to power. His own claim is that we ought to resuscitate our powers and recognize them as our own and not transpose them to the Christian God. Similarly, we ought not transpose them to some dream of a, a nature that we don't really know much about. Instead, we ought to recognize them as ours. So he too wants to maintain that will to power is our primary motivation, indeed his primary motivation. The seeking out of otherworldly views, uh, different kinds of asceticism, is part of what drives Nietzsche throughout his career. And one finds it in all sorts of different places. Uh, Kathy just mentioned science and scholarship more generally, and in the last lecture I pointed out that there's a sense in which one can lose oneself in the past. One can deny life by, in effect, trying to look at other people's lives. That's a version of the otherworldly. One also sees it in, for example, Hegel's view. Not so much the general sense of the phenomenology that I discussed before, but rather in the view of history as something which, as Hegel puts it himself, dwarfs the individual, virtually makes him insignificant. And if one takes that worldview and really focuses on it and really does diminish one's view of him or herself, then it's also a sense of otherworldliness, a sense of self-denial. One really does find oneself caught in a vision in which one doesn't make much difference. Tolstoy in one of the uh, epilogues to War and Peace, takes the Hegelian vision and describes in very concrete terms what we don't get from Hegel. Um, the major players in the uh, war between the French and the Russians and the Battle of Borodino in particular, Napoleon on the one hand, the Russian generals on the other, and he says of them, even though they thought they were instrumental, in fact, decisive, 
in making the decisions that would change world history. The fact is that they were just pawns in the hands of a much larger force, uh, fate itself. That too is a kind of otherworldliness, a kind of self-denial, and if one thinks of oneself that way, then one does in fact reduce oneself to insignificance. That of course is very much a picture which we get in some forms of Buddhism, that one sees the world as a whole, and one sees the self as an illusion, and the idea which is captured in Schopenhauer, is again to reduce oneself to insignificance. You find it too in the kind of antiquarianism that Nietzsche both praises and rejects. What he praises is appreciating the past as our past, but what he rejects is losing ourselves in the past. That too is an otherworldliness. Or one thinks of Marx's classless society, the idea of a future in which there will be no classes, in which there will be no class conflict, in which presumably there will be prosperity and happiness. Marx doesn't really spell it out very much. But one can see in, for example, the life of some of our current day Marxists. Uh, what they do is they live in the theory. They live in this future dream. And consequently, they are as ascetic as any religious cult. One finds it, too, in something Camus writes about in The Myth of Sisyphus when he talks about what he calls philosophical suicide. Now, in particular, he's referring to Kierkegaard and certain forms of religious resignation. But what he has in mind is a more general thesis, which might be put, it's whenever you give up on this life, whenever you look to another life or a future state of affairs, whenever you don't appreciate the moments of this life, what you're doing is basically suicide. It's rejecting life. It's what Nietzsche calls a naysaying to life. I was thinking about this as we were flying the other day, which is something we do quite frequently. And we were in an airport, and I watched one of many people walking down the halls of O'Hare Airport in Chicago, talking on a cell phone. And he was utterly oblivious to people around him. He was just having a conversation with someone or other. And the thought occurred to me, probably not fair to the fellow in question, but he really was somewhere else. And that idea of being somewhere else, as I thought about it, really does capture an awful lot of our present secular existence. To talk about asceticism doesn't require a religious concept of the otherworldly or a platonic view of a certain kind of heaven. And it doesn't promote necessarily a kind of peacefulness, the sorts of things that, for example, certain Buddhist and Hindu and Taoist sects aim for in their ascetic practices but rather it can even be in a kind of frenzy. And I was thinking how much of our current life really is caught up in that sort of thing. Talking on the telephone, cell phones in particular, our emphasis on email, or going back a few years, uh, people who walk around in public or in nature with Walkman on, with earphones listening to music. I don't care whether it's Beethoven or whether it's the latest in grunge rock, but there's a sense in which there's somewhere else. And the picture that I kind of want to at least entertain is that there are all sorts of ways which we, in our frenzied secular world, are now inventing of also not being in this life, not paying attention to our lives, but in a sense always being otherworldly. And that doesn't mean necessarily ethereal or even philosophical.